joining me on our what could be our last lecture um, on biology for this semester. So great job so far. We're going to be wrapping up our conversation about ecology by talking about a branch of ecology that focuses on conservation, and that is conservation biology. In conservation biology, we seek to identify the threats to species diversity through diversity in general, and then to neutralize those threats. And so that starts with an understanding of the environment around us. But before we can do any of that, we have to think about why we might care that we do keep diversity. Keeping diversity, participating in conservation is not easy and it's usually not convenient. And so one of the first things that we need to do in order to start thinking as a conservation biologist is to buy in to the importance of conservation for all of our sake. There are three, I mean, there are millions of reasons why one might care about the environment, but there are three that I think we can kind of wrap all of the ideas up in. The first is a philosophical or moral reason. One of the cool things about teaching at Bishop is that I can describe to you that in Christianity, we are told as Christians that we are meant to be stewards of our environment. A steward of the environment means its care is left to you. And so just for a moral reason, we were given the job of protecting the earth and we should do that. Another maybe more practical reason is that diversity might hold the key to helping you. Sometimes we think about conserving from the perspective of selfishness. We can think about the fact that we need to preserve diversity because perhaps someday I'm going to need a medicine and that medicine is stored in the diversity of the rainforest. And if we slash and burn it, if we lose those species, then I will be physically harmed or at least not helped by that loss. Or maybe things like global warming, if the water levels rise, that might affect my life and it might be negative for me on the daily, in which case, practically, it would make more sense to help conserve now so that, you know, in the future, things are better. And lastly, the environment does things for us that we can't quite put a finger on. Things like cleaning our water, letting the water go through the groundwater system and then back up actually purifies the water in a way that humans really don't have the technology to purify. So in some ways, the natural environment provides a service that humans can't replicate. It does something that is intrinsically better than our human skills. And so we aren't ready to replace it, so we certainly shouldn't damage it. These are all different angles you could come at for why you should care about the environment, but hopefully now you have thought of a reason that works for you about why you care and why this next step we're gonna learn really does matter. One of the roles of an ecologist, a conservation biologist, is to identify the diversity. There are three levels of diversity that we're gonna talk about. The first one is genetic diversity, and we've already sort of touched on this, this is the idea that a certain species needs to have many alleles available, neutral alleles available, so that if the environment changes, they are able to use that raw material allele in order to evolve, adapt to the new environment. This could be something like disease resistance. It could be something like tolerance to toxins. All sorts of things change in our environment and the genetic diversity that a species would have helps to keep them very healthy. We've discussed before that organisms that have gone through a bottleneck lose their genetic diversity, and that is problematic for them moving forward. Their species, although they can have many organisms now, the organisms are so similar to one another that there really isn't the richness to keep the species healthy. Species diversity tells us that a community is healthy if there are many different species living within it. If we lose the decomposers or the primary producers or the tertiary consumers, the high level consumers, the 
community loses its health. If we lose a food source, if we lose a predator, we start to undercut the overall health of the environment. What I mean by that is if we lose a food source, uh, one of the producers or one of the primary consumers, a rabbit or a certain kind of plant gets destroyed, then all of the trophic levels above that level are negatively affected by the change. Reversely, if you have a keystone predator like the gray wolf leave an ecosystem, it unbalances the ecosystem. You get too many of the grazing animals and then they overconsume the food and then their numbers drive down and it starts to cause all sorts of like avalanches of problems. So we want species diversity. And then above that even, we want ecosystem diversity. We don't want the whole earth to have the same ecosystem because that would cut down on species diversity worldwide. And that species diversity is what we really rely on for future change. So we want to acknowledge like in this ecosystem over here that we have tall tree wooded area, but then we also have this kind of shrubland and this freshwater community and that all of those communities work together to increase species diversity and hopefully genetic diversity. When ecologists find a species or community or ecosystem in trouble, one of the things that they seek to identify are the keystone predators. A keystone predator is a particular species that has a disproportionate control over the diversity of the community or ecosystem. This is where a certain organism just happens to be super important more important for some reason than any of the other organisms in that particular community or ecosystem. One example of that is the sea otter here. So sea otters like to float on their backs like this and they actually hold hands sometimes and they munch on sea urchins. So what they do is they dive down to the bottom. It's hard to dive down that deep, but they dive down to the bottom. They pick up a bunch of sea urchins. They bring them up to the top and then they float around and they eat them. This doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? Sea urchins, you hardly even ever see them move. But if the sea urchins don't get eaten by the sea otter, the sea urchins will destroy the kelp forest. Sea urchins consume what's called a hold fast. It's kind of like a root on the bottom of a kelp. And they would consume these algae and they would break the hold fast off and the kelp would float away. And if the kelp floats away, then the smaller herbivores and all of these other animals would die off because they need to live in the kelp forest and the abalones. And then if these things are dead, then the large crabs and the fish and the small predatory animals, they wouldn't be able to consume the lower level organisms because those lower level organisms would be dead because the sea urchins would have killed the kelp. The entire ecosystem revolves around otters consuming urchins, which is one really important reason why we shouldn't kill sea otters. Now, sea otters are cute. Maybe you're thinking, why would we kill them anyway? But people like to hunt sea otter for their pelt. Sea otters also get injured, damaged in boats and boating accidents, in fisher nets. Sea otters are incredibly important, but also a fragile member of an ecosystem. And so that's an example of a keystone predator. And when you're trying to maintain species diversity, one important thing to identify or to look for is a keystone predator. What we're gonna talk about next are the main threats against ecology. Where do we perceive the arrows are coming from when it comes to species diversity? What really impacts it? And there's a list, I mean, depending on where you look in your book, on the internet, there are many, many contributing factors to something that's overarchingly called global change. And what global change encompasses is the loss of keystone predators, global warming, disease spread, hunting and poaching, land use, pollution, all of those kinds of things are all kind of encompassed together into something called global change. The biggest threat to diversity is global change. And these are five 
parts of global change, habitat loss and fragmentation, induced species, over harvesting, climate change, and pollution. And all of these are caused by humans. Humans are the threat to diversity. Humans are the problem. Humans are also the only organism that could solve this problem. And so I was looking for humans are the problem and the solution, and I found uh, this picture of Loki, right? Every villain is a hero in his own mind. Anything from Marvel connection, right? Humans are the problem and they are the solution. And that is often the message that you get in Marvel movies. We are gonna take some time and we're gonna look at each one of these threats to diversity, starting with habitat loss and fragmentation. So habitat loss and fragmentation doesn't sound too difficult to understand. Even when we have a natural preserve, we tend to set up highways through that preserve. Um, my parents were just driving home from Texas the other day and they were mentioning that they were driving down this road and there are all these deer on the side of the road and it's protected and the deer are protected and there's no fence and you're in the wilderness and at any moment those deer could just come shooting across the road threatening obviously your life as the driver but also their life as the deer and that's not the deer's fault every time we create a road an inroad we decrease the ability of the interior species to survive for example bear need a large hunting ground. They need a large home space. And so if we cut this whole space straight through with the road, what we've really decreased is the interior species. And those tend to be your apex predators, your more important keystone features of a habitat or community. Even in preserves, even in national parks, when you cut a road through an area, you fragment that area. Not to mention humans just literally spreading into any wilderness that is around. Another threat is something called an introduced or invasive species. An introduced species comes into a area and it has no natural predators and it is maybe able to outcompete local competitors. For example, these are rabbits that were released in Australia. They started out, these are cottontail rabbits. You can see the little um, cottontail. These are rabbits that were introduced in Australia and they were introduced in a small number and a few of them got out and probably people thought it was so funny and so cute, but these are mammals. These are not marsupial mammals. They are more hardy in a head-to-head -head competition than any other rodents in Australia they outcompete every rodent in Australia. Then on top of that, there are no natural predators. So nothing is consuming them. So they are able to consume food all throughout the outback with no natural predators. Their population is booming so much so that they actually built a fence across Australia to try to keep the rabbits on one side of the fence try to keep them from crossing the whole outback because they were such a threat to the ecosystems in Australia. And if you live in Australia, you know that these rabbits are considered total vermits and you need to, people hunt them, they try to get rid of them, they're trying to trap and kill them. Nothing they're doing is working. They tried releasing predators that were natural to the rabbits. They would hunt the rabbits, but it turned out it was easier to catch other prey. So they didn't even go after the rabbits. So now we have another problem of these predators. The spiral of issues, right? And once again, humans are the problem and the solution. They're still working on a solution for how to fix this release of these rabbits or at least deter them from taking over all of the Australian outback. Another threat that humans pose is over harvesting from hunting, poaching, and farming. We already talked about the sea otters. That's an example of over harvesting for poaching. Um, this is a tiger here, really prized possession to have a tiger pelt. There's so few tigers left in the world, we need to keep them alive. So up until now, most of what we've been talking about is something that's really being done on purpose. They all have two sides to the coin though. This is a really difficult thing. 
Over harvesting also includes farming. Monoculture, where you farm the same material over and over again, strips the soil of nutrients and really causes problems for the environment where farming happens. But farming provides food to feed the humans. So how do we get away from it? These are not necessarily easily solved problems. These are threats to diversity, and it's our job to think about how we might propose solving them. Climate change is another really major concern in our ecosystem. Both the atmosphere and the oceans have been warming, and our Arctic sea and ice glaciers are decreasing. And this is a huge problem, huge, way bigger than a few extra degrees. Um, this includes weather patterns, but more importantly, if our dissolved oxygen in the oceans gets too low, we lose the species diversity in the oceans, including fish. And as you start to remove those food sources, you're going to remove the food sources from all of the ocean, and it's going to cause a lot of problems. You get sulfur producing bacteria that grow in too high of numbers. You get big sulfur storms that are coming into the earth. Things that have happened before on this earth when the climate was warmer. And so there are some pretty serious consequences to global warming. And we need to take it pretty seriously that it needs to start getting reversed. This can force the movement of species because of weather patterns and changes. They like warmer temperatures or like cooler temperatures. So they start to spread out. Other animals can't handle it and they succumb to the changes. Uh, you have coral bleaching because the waters are getting too warm. You have things like polar bears not able to find food. Another really major issue is pollution. And this is a river in Indonesia and it is absolutely covered in pollution. Not only is there just literal pollution in the water, but then those water bottles those bottles start leaching chemicals into the environment. Heavy metals like lead from leaded gasoline start to create lead in water and then our fish consume it and then we consume the fish and you start getting lead poisoning in humans. The CFCs that were released uh, in aerosols before have caused a hole in the ozone layer and even more recently toxic algal blooms because of the temperature of the ocean. You're getting this algae that's just blooming all throughout the ocean. It's choking off, killing fish. Really serious things that are happening because of pollution. There are whole trash islands. You can Google it. Many of these things are worth a little Googling um, some time to kind of look through the internet and find some points of concern. There are many. There are many places where our effort is needed. Aside from just those kind of human threats, we're going to go back for a second to the idea of humans taking over the actual lands. When you look at the earth here, you can see that the green areas are protected lands. Only the green areas. So only in those areas are there any protections for endangered species, for conservation, for checking for species diversity. Only 7%, but at least there's 7%. And so comes another question, how do we handle these? In Costa Rica, they tend to do preserves evenly kind of spread out so that it would be like neighborhood and then preserve and then neighborhood and then preserve and neighborhood and then preserve. In the United States, we handle it really differently and we put a whole big land together and we say like, don't touch Yosemite National Park, done, preserved. But then we just go ahead and let all of the houses build up all through Southern California. Should these preserves be close to humans so that humans can tend to them? Or should they be super rural so that humans can't get to them? Should we have lots of them or large lands? What should we do? How do we handle this 7%? Do we need to take more of the land? Should we be taking that land away from current residences? Should we be putting land back into preserve? How would that work? Who would buy the land? Who would own the land? All of these things are a part of your future. One of the things I like to tell my 
children sometimes when I am done teaching and I'm in a little bit of a cranky mood because maybe, just maybe my students weren't perfect all day. I like to tell my children, look, I'm in a bad mood and that's not your fault, but it is your problem. And I have to tell you guys, this isn't even my fault necessarily, the whole thing, but it is absolutely my problem. And as soon as we can get through the fact that we don't wonder whose fault it is, and we realize that this problem affects every single one of our intrinsic beliefs and philosophies, our health and humanity's health, our convenience, all of those things are affected by this problem. And that includes us. We, this is our problem. So what can we do? This was depressing. I don't know. This isn't the most happy thing to learn about. Here's a little bit more bad news. Okay. The earth's sea level is expected to rise one to six feet before the end of this century. So in the next 80 years, the rate of global sea rise is happening much faster than it was in the last 2000 years. The average global temperature is definitely increasing. The frequency of weather-related disasters has increased by 46% in the last 20 years. And if we continue at this rate, nearly half of all plants and animals are at risk of extinction on earth. Yikes. So what can we do? I often see things that say like recycle. And that is such a tough answer. Because sure, recycling's great if someone's recycling it. And if they're recycling it in a good steward way where they're not releasing more pollution as they recycle. So what I was trying to find is something that's just a little bit more reduce in its nature. Okay, so one example would be to use fluorescent bulbs. Uh, to turn off your computer, to unplug your plugs from the outlet when you're not using them to recycle glass. Glass is a really good, definitely recyclable thing. Stop using plastic, find an alternative. Use a reusable bag, reusable sandwich bags. We now even have reusable um, cloth bags to hold our produce when we come home from the grocery store. So you know, you usually grab those like flimsy plastic bags, but I have now um, bags I got on Amazon that will hang on to that for you and they actually help your produce stay good longer. Use both sides of a piece of paper. Wrap presents using recycled or reused wrapping paper. I mean, in our house, I <laughs> I made a commitment to a friend. It was funny. We were just chatting one day to not buy any more wrapping paper. And with very few exception, I don't purchase it anymore. I reuse wrapping paper. We creatively wrap, wrap in burlap, wrap in you know, some other kind of material that is reusable. Sew your own little bags. My daughter sewed a bunch of bags for Christmas this year for Christmas presents. Drink tap water or drink water out of the big water coolers instead of water, small water bottles. Bring a reusable bottle. All of these things will help. All of these things will help more effectively than simply putting some plastic in a recycling can. Okay. It's changes, small changes to our behavior. And we are able to do this guys. We can make an impact. One of the roles that you have is starting to consider how can you impact this problem? Problem's not your fault, but it is your problem. So we will consider these things a little bit more when I see you in class. And I hope that you guys have a really nice day and I will see you in class soon.